me. So this, so welcome to my podcast. Um, Thank you. The biohacking uh, life hacks. Uh, biohacking because you know I'm a biohacker, and biohacking is all about optimizing. By the way, it's okay. about optimizing your health, your performance, and your age. Optimizing you know everything in your life. So I'm in these big groups called biohackers, and they're always posting on the forums. So- Right. So biohacking isn't something you made up. It's a bigger oh it's a yeah, thing. It, it's massive. It, it, it's all over the world. Um, Don't mind me. I'm going to take notes. Yeah, that's a yeah. I do that as well. It just so uh, allows because I'm going to look that up. I just when I saw it on your podcast thing, I thought that was just sort of like a catchy thing that you had made up. No, no. There's there's, there's probably I, I reckon probably about a hundred thousand biohackers in the world or something like that. Oh there's wow, a lot of us. Uh, it's a big big business. And more and more people are entering the biohacking because as they're finding out, uh, as it's becoming more and more popular. It's basically, how can I, it only came about 10, 15 years ago because um, people were so disappointed in the, uh, you know, the general pharmaceutical industry, the general um, health system, which is not really a health system, that a whole new industry developed over the last 15 years, which completely you know, removes that. And it's so it's health in terms of real health rather than just disease management. Interesting. Yeah, because the, the work that, that I do is um, revolves around identity in the same way, right? Optimizing your sense of yourself, who you are, uh, how to understand yourself, and then how to be able to communicate who you are in the world around you. And, and enhancing your connectedness to yourself, to the universe, to other people. So it's a, I suppose it's a type of biohack. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be physical. It can be uh, mental, the mindset, emotional, mm-hmm. spiritual, whatever. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah, you know. it's, a, it's about that. So. Yeah, it's about just anything, that, you know. So, uh, yeah, so, so welcome to my, so basically the reason I started this podcast is um because I do a lot of life hacks. I'm always looking at how to optimize everything. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, hang on a minute. Obviously, you know, other people will have these as well. Mm -hmm. And so I started it to to find out what other people's life hacks are Mm -hmm. in the hope that I could then incorporate some of them into my life. And uh, and I do stand-up comedy. And so for the first 10 um, life hack podcasts I did, they were all comedians. Uh, but you know, once you've interviewed like the fifth or the sixth comedian, you you're like bored with interviewing comedians. So yeah, like, but you okay. start with where you know, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So then, yeah. then I was like, okay, I want to move into, I want to interview other people other than just comedians. Um, and so then I started putting this out. And so thank you, thank you very much for for coming on for giving us your, your yeah. Time. No, I'm excited. This is actually my second ever podcast. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. And so, so tell tell us a bit by yourself. Who are you? Where you? Where you're coming from? And you know, um, you hear? well, uh, people come to me when uh, they find themselves stuck, right? Um, people people want things. They want to feel better. They want they want growth. They want to uh, they want more out of their life. And a lot of people can't seem to get out of their own way or out of their own heads, right? So I've developed a unique and proven process that helps to people uh, to recognize their strengths, their shortcomings, and feel fantastic about not only today, but where they're headed, right? Uh, a lot of times when you don't have these life hacks that you're talking about, uh, it's it's easy to feel a little hopeless about where you are now and, and not to know where you want to go, right? So... Um, so the work that I do with people, uh, the work we do together helps them understand where they are so they have a, a roadmap to where they're going to go, how to get unstuck, as it were. So you talked about your, um, you have a process. Yeah. And well, how, I have a pro- How would you describe that process? You know, like in, in you know. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, there's, a, there's a couple different things. Um, I, the... I co-founded a group called the King Collective, right? And and under the auspices of the King Collective, 
I do um, educational events. So that's some of it. So let's say you run across me somewhere online and, and you're interested in learning more and you know, you're, it appeals to you, right? So you sign up and you come to an intensive. And so in the weekend intensive, there's a whole process that you go through that, that we put people through to help them become aware of themselves, right? It's like, it's a, we call it a five part process, right? It's called introspection, container, actualization, vulnerability, and then safety. I C A B S is how we break it down, right? So the first thing you do is uh, introspection. Like everything starts with who am I, right? Everything starts with who am I? What's going on with me? What's my identity, right? And then uh, from there, you create a container for yourself and ultimately for other people to like to dive into it, to, to, to create a platform, as it were, or a container, right? Um, in this process of introspection, you become aware of who you really are and what really matters to you. So you get closer to being who, who you really are. What, who am I really underneath all this, right? Like we, we come out the gate and we have all these things that society tells us we're supposed to be and things that we missed and we didn't look at and then roles we get dropped into. Right. So we take on roles of like, you know, now I'm a child. Now I'm a college student. Now I'm a, an employee, now I'm a, you know, and, and sometimes we can go, years and years myself in this in this case without really evaluating like who am i right i especially when you get good at some of these things right you're a good employee you're a good parent right that becomes who you think you are yeah. right the role instead of the person right so this process of introspection is like well if i put down all the roles who am i right and sometimes the pro the beginning of that process is terrifying Especially as, as it's been in my case where like the answer that comes right back is I don't know. Mm. Right? Like and yeah. so sometimes sometimes people will stop right there and just go back to their roles because they're good at them and they're safe and comfortable, right? Being a this, being a that, right? But you never get to who am I. And I I've gone I've gone years without getting quiet enough to do this work of who am I really. Like all those things put aside, right? Um, once you become aware a little bit about who you really are and what really matters to you, then the V is the vulnerability, right? Then you're in a position to begin to communicate that to others. And so when you come to our intensives, there's a whole process that we put you through about how to do that, right? How to hold space. That The S is the safety at the end, which is uh, we create a safe and educational environment for people to begin to do this process. So you come to us and we put you through this introspective process, then we sit you down in front of someone else and begin to guide you through what is it like to really show up as yourself and then hold space for other people to show up as themselves. And it requires the suspension of roles, of beliefs, of judgment, so you can just be with you and be with the other person and begin to share. And we have a series of curated questions that we put people through. So in, in, in three hours at the beginning of our weekends, after three hours, people are more connected to the person sitting in front of them that they didn't know than they are with people they've known for 10 or 20 years. Just by getting clear about who you are, being having the courage to speak, and then having the willingness to just sit and listen. Right? No judgment. And, and these are in BDSM or, or kink environments. And so the other thing that we have people do are put down all of those labels, right? People come into a kink workshop and they think they're looking to be a dominant or submissive or this or that. And we start with, no, you're none of those things. Put all of those things down. And you're a person, right? So our philosophy is called people before kink because we believe that who you are is way more important than what you do, right? Yes, in all of these things in, in yoga, in tantra, in, in kink, in, we take on roles that we engage with each other in. But before all that, we're people. It really started out because I, I hosted events for years. And you would go to an event and someone would come in new in this mindset of I'm looking for, I'm looking for. And they, you know, like I, I have I, what they call a switch, right? So I'm dominant and I'm submissive in the ways that I am in the world, right? So I'd be in an event and clearly more in a dominant space and someone would come up to me and go, oh, mistress, mistress, will you do this? And I'm like, hi, my name is Kat. 
right? Like I'm a person first, like let's address each other as people. And so that's really where all of this started out of, uh, is from this philosophy of people before kink that we just developed mostly out of a desire to get out of these very transactional ways of being in the world. So. All right. Okay. And, and you mentioned who you, who am I? So, so who are you? Who am I? That's a good mm. question. It, it's, that's a work in progress, actually. Um, I came out of uh, a situation five years ago. I had been married to someone who I was doing not this exact work with, but hosting events and being in the community. And I had a club where I hosted events. And uh, my husband got sick. And several months passed. So the business that we were running became mine. I got evicted from my home. I, I, it was a long series of life events over the last five years that sort of propelled me into what I'm now understanding as this dark night of the soul thing, right? Like I had had a lot of hats. I had been carrying a lot of roles and doing a lot of things. And when I would say to myself, but cat, who are you? The little voice would come back and say, I don't really know. And I'd be afraid of that. So I'd be like, well, let's just do more of this stuff that we're good at over here. We don't have to pay attention to that. Um, and while I know a lot of things about me, I'm still in the process of uncovering who am I really, right? Like, you know, uh, I was, I was looking through some of the questions that you asked me, right? Like, and, uh, I was contemplating on the fact that one of the, one of the life hacks is, uh, asking for help, mm. right? Yes. Uh, my mother passed when I was a child and I, my father remarried right away and I had some challenges that I, at 11, I recognized were, were my problem, right? Were my challenges. So in the seventh grade, I went to the school psychologist and I said, this is what's going on. And I think there's something wrong with me, right? Like I've been asking for help for a lot of years. And, uh, and I think it's really helpful to stay in a place where you are willing to ask for help. I run into people all the time who are not, who are afraid to ask for help or feel like it means they look a certain kind of way if they ask for help or it, it's admitting weakness and like there's something wrong with being vulnerable, right? It's like getting comfortable with vulnerability. So uh, that didn't really answer your question. Um, no, but that, that, uh, that, that happens, more, I think, more to men uh, than women because men, we're almost programmed from the, you know, in our culture. I mean, I'm, I'm a Sikh. And so in the Sikh community, we, you know, the men are warriors, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're programmed literally in our culture not to ask for help. And so for a big portion of my life, like asking for help was just like a massive sign of weakness, a massive sign that you're not a man. And so I went through hell because I didn't ask for help. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And but as soon as like. Like I was like my marriage was just hell, and uh, I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. Like I'm not a man. That I can't even manage my own marriage. That my wife dominated me, and I, that like how does that happen? You know, like I'm a man. You know, and so even to my parents, even to my brothers, and my sisters, everything is perfect. Everything is great. Like you know, and internally, all hell was breaking loose, breaking loose in my marriage, but. On the outside, even to the, my brother, it's great. Like when my brother found out, like I was getting divorced ten years later. It's like, but you guys were the perfect couple, you know. Like and I'm like, okay, yeah, you right. had some really bad filters on there. But like, and and it, and I never asked for help because it was just like it just didn't even like for a long time. It wasn't even in my psyche to even the thought I should ask for help it wasn't even there. Mm -hmm. you know? So I yeah. think for men it is the bigger problem. Yeah, and you mentioned shame, and shame has a lot to do with it. Um, you know, and, and staying open, right? Like I'm 58 years old, and there are things that go on for me that sometimes I get all in my head about, like, I can't believe I'm having to do this. Like some should in my head says that I should be somewhere other than where I am right now, right? Like um, I sat with my partners um, on... 
Friday. I don't remember which day it was. Um, but I find this thing I said to you about my auditory hearing, my auditory process, and you're the first other only person I've, I've said that to openly out front, right? Mm. I've been, I have had a lot of shame around it, right? And I sat with them and I explained it to them and they were like, thank you. And I was like t crying. I was so like embarrassed and ashamed about the fact that I, and, and I've only recently learned that there's a difference between hearing and auditory processing. Um, and I heard someone speak about it not that long ago. And I was like, that's what's going on for me because I can hear, but I'm constantly asking people to repeat themselves and I don't know why. And by the time you've asked someone a second or third time what they've said, and you still don't know what they said, there's an embarrassment that comes up for like, I can't ask them again. So I do this thing where I would just pretend that I understood what you said. Right. And and I, you know, and I would lose some amount of what the person was trying to communicate, right? And this is what I teach is communication, right? But here I am stuck on something that I'm not even sure why I'm stuck on it. And I'm too embarrassed to say anything about it. And I'm too ashamed to acknowledge that this is what's going on for me. And so it was a big moment for me to say, even to those closest to me, this is what's happening for me. And I feel really powerless over it because I don't seem to know at this point what to do about it. But the truth is, is I'm way closer now because I've said it out loud, right? I've acknowledged it. I've become willing to speak about it to people around me. And only in that way does anything get like close enough to being able to, for a solution to come, right? When we stay, yeah. stu when we stay stuck in shame, when we stay stuck in what's wrong. There's no room for like, growth to happen and change to happen, right? Acknowledging where I am, um, being willing to be honest about it with myself and other people is what enables change to start to happen. So I found myself just now saying to you, I have this thing about hearing and you're the first person that I've actually just, who I don't know, who I'm about yeah. to engage in a conversation with, that I've set it up front and now I know that if I ask you to repeat something again, you'll understand why I'm doing it. And then I don't have to feel so ashamed for doing it. Yeah. yeah. Like this is the microcosm about what it all is about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have something similar, uh, but, but, but only with names. Right. I'm, I'm okay with everything else, but names, I just, I don't know what it is. I can't like, uh, there's, a, um, there's a woman I hadn't seen for like, couple of months and I know her really well you know and I bumped into her at an event and I couldn't remember her name so she came out gave me a hug you know like all that kind of stuff and I'm like oh damn it how do I um you know greet her without you know so I was like oh, I gotta go to the toilet I gotta go to the toilet so I went to the toilet but I went to to check her up on Facebook <laughs> oh her name is oh yeah yeah okay got it right and that came out Right. Well, there's a life hack right there. Right. Yeah. Because there's truth. It's like, that's a hard thing to lead with. And I, I, you know how I've gotten around that for myself is because I've been a bartender in my history. Uh, and I just say, it's a bartender thing. I'll always remember what you drink and everything you told about me, it's told to me about you, but I won't ever remember your name. Uh, see, it's I, I, kind of a bartender thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cause but, I, 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 I met some bartender really good at remembering names. Like you're going, what? <laughs> I'm good at remembering drinks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, see, I worked in the IT industry. I worked um, in um, in computers. And so for me to, uh, I just didn't need to remember anybody's name, to be honest. <laughs> just need to and some of that stuff I think is skill. Yeah. Like we get good at what we practice. And like you said, you're in an industry that didn't require you to like really know names. And so it's like, it's a lazier part of the brain, the part that remembers names. I just called everybody dude. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Hi, honey. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> hey, love, it's good to see you. <laughs> I think I, I, I made, made sure I remembered, I think it was like two names. The person who I reported to and the person that signed my time assigned my timesheets. That's it. That's the only two names I needed to know. Everybody else is a dude. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. The other, the other, the other hack I use for that is when I'm out somewhere socially and I know the one person's name, 
I go to make an introduction. I'm like, oh, well, this is Jane. And then I point to the other person with a pause, waiting for the other person to step in and say, oh, yeah, I'm John. <laughs> it works a good deal of the time. <laughs> All right, that's good. Yeah, I, I, because I tried doing something similar as well. I, um, what do I do? I'll go, oh, why don't you, uh, uh, I, I'll introduce one. And then I'll say, well, well, why don't I leave you two to, um, to, to, to have a quick chat while I go and get a drink? <laughs> and, and then, then you just... get up your Facebook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank God for social media. Where, where would yeah. we be for that? Yeah, because no. I, I, can, I can find them on Facebook quite quickly like, because yeah. I know what they look like. I'm, you know, I know where they and are. And you know who they are. Yeah, it's just, yeah, you can't remember yeah. their name. It's yeah. not like you forget everything about the person. You just don't remember their name. Yeah. yeah. And, and, my, and my girlfriend says, I'm just, I just don't care. I mean, that's... <laughs> The, the reason but I that's remember. the fear. The fear is yeah. if I don't remember your name, you think that I don't care. You think that I don't remember anything about you. And so that everything you've shared with me up until now has been, you know, sort of cavalierly put aside because I don't remember your name. And that's not true. Yeah, that's it. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. true that I don't well, remember all the things we shared. I just don't happen to remember your name right now. And then you, you mentioned identity. Mm -hmm. So what is identity? That's a good question. Um, my understanding of it, at least when I say it, is, is like a working knowledge of who we are. Right? Like, it, it's, it's a sum total of, of our story, you know, the things that brought us to where we are today. But it's... When we put people through the questions in the, in the weekend intensive, we ask people to look at themselves and ask them, ask yourselves questions about like, what makes you feel drawn to another person? What, what makes you want to know someone better? What are those qualities, right? Like, uh, what, what does it take for you to trust someone? What does that look like? Right. So we use these kind of questions to peel back layers of, well, what does it take me for, to trust someone? What is trust to me? Right. So it's being able to answer fundamental questions like that. Like we, we talk about uh, characteristics, values, morals, right? Morals being um, ethics being the rules, right? So like I can be ethical mm -hmm. by uh, adhering to the law but not necessarily moral. Um, and so what are my ethics and what are my morals? What do I believe in? Right. And so then what kind of people, what values are important to me that like I'm drawn to people who are loyal. Loyalty is important to me. Right. So that's part of my identity is to, I aspire to be a loyal person and I am interested to being around other people who are loyal. Right, so loyalty is an important quality to me. Um, my little camera says that there's nine minutes left. Yes, that's okay, yeah. It's okay. just because I've got a free account. Uh, oh, okay. And so you restart it, I guess. We'll restart it in about five, six minutes. Okay. I was just distracted by it. Um, so it's things like that. Like, what qualities attract me to other people? Who, who, what, what kind of a person do I aspire to be in the world? Right? Like honesty is another really important trait for me. And honesty is tricky, right? Because there's different levels of honesty. Mm. There's what we call cash register honesty, right? So like, do I not steal kind of honesty, right? Then there's like lies of commission. Do I just tell people things that aren't true? And then there's lies of omission, which is, am I not speaking things that I actually should be speaking? Right? Am I not telling my truth out of fear? you know, out of shame. Um, so there's, there's, we peel back levels of honesty, right? And those things are important to me and they're challenging. You know, there's a kind of, a, lies of omission are everywhere. I don't want to hurt someone's feelings. Therefore, I won't say this, mm. right? I don't, I don't want to look a certain kind of way to people. So therefore, I won't share this about myself, right? So honesty is a, is a great quality. That, uh, that I think has a very high bar to it in its, yeah. in, its, in its finer forms, right? But there's freedom to be able to say, 
um, that I that I will speak the truth to people. And I'm still wrestling with this, right? I come out of the recovery community, and um, and so I've learned I've learned a lot of my life hacks in in recovery circles, right? So uh, you know, the counterweight to honesty is this six part uh, criteria that I was taught to put things through before I opened my mouth, which is, uh, is it, is it necessary? Is it true? And is it kind? Like uh, I've come across it, that. Yeah. And then the other thing is, does it need to be said? Does it need to be said by me? And does it need to be said right now? Right. So when I'm feeling a certain kind of way about something or somebody, and I'm not sure if this is something, am I just hiding behind my fear and I don't want to speak? Or is this something I really don't need to say? If I run it through that criteria, I can usually get an answer. Right? Like if it's necess- if it's true and it's necessary and I can deliver it in a way that's kind and I determine that it needs to be said and it needs to be said by me and right now, then I can find my way clear to say it. Right. If I get a flag internally on any one of those questions and I sit with it for a second, it's like, yeah, this does need to be said. And I do need to say it at some point. But now is not the best time because I'm looking at where the person's at and the environment that we're in. And, you know, if what I'm going to say can be something that is challenging to them and they're on their way out to something, then that's not kind because it's not a good time. Right. So there's this like filter of how and when to speak a truth that takes the other person into account. Mm, you, you mentioned kind. Mm-hmm. That, 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 that's a really important, because like a lot of the times uh, when we need to say something, like, and I know it happens a lot with me, is I forget the kind bit. Like I yeah. forget that, you know, that other person is valid as well. I'm like, mm-hmm. no, this is how it is. And, the, you know, there's no kind in there whatsoever. You know, and then and they take it badly, because, right? Uh, yeah. Because if I mean, at a minimum, they weren't in a place to hear it, right? Because yeah, they've got something and I else didn't, going. And I wasn't kind. No, like, oh, the way you said it, yeah, you said it differently. Know, yes, because I because I was just thinking about me. I wasn't looking at, it. but that's a really good one. I think for me, I shouldn't start adding. How do I say this in a kind way? Do you know, how do I get this across in a kind way? Because, you know, I think like when you do that, it, it, they receive it way better. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so how do I incorporate that? Like, so, so like, what, what are your, like, for me, like, my three biggest life hacks is keto, um, keto, um, intermittent fasting, and uh, breath work. Do you know, like, all three of those things. I do every single day. It's all, it's just part of my life. So, so, and, and, and they basically, you like my life, even if I, if I was going to a desert island, those three things would come with me. Do you know, like, it doesn't matter where I am. Like, mm-hmm. I've, I've changed my whole life around being keto. And so, like, if I'm meeting friends or if I'm going to a friend's house, uh, or we're meeting at the restaurant, I'm like, I only eat keto. Right? And so, if I get there and it's not keto, I'm fasting that day. That's it. That's how I work it. Um, wow. So what are your like three biggest life hacks that you do on a daily basis? Uh, it, off the top of my head, I'll say prayer, meditation, and pause. Right? Mm. Um, th- this is in no particular order, right? Like when I pray, I literally like I just I sit and I open my top chakra right? My connectedness. And I allow myself to connect with spirit, whatever you want to call it, God, spirit, universe, divine. I, it's all the same stuff, right? Yeah. Um, meditation is, ju- is just that practice of sitting and being quiet. And I'm not as, uh, I'm not as up on mine as you are on yours. I don't get to meditate every single day. But it's a it's a practice. You know, meditation is a practice. It's not an achievement. Yeah. Um, and so there's the practice of that. And then, you know, this thing about like how do I remember to be kind is because when I feel the impulse to speak, I pause. 
right? And yeah. then I think about this criteria. I remind myself in the pause, oh yeah, I want to be kind before I open my mouth. So when, when, when things don't sit right with me, when I start to get agitated, slowing down is another one. Right. When I, when I get that feeling that like, mm, I need to whatever, that's a sign to me to, to slow down and to calm down and then to pause and pray and meditate and see what is it that I need to be doing right now. Right. As opposed to what happens, the more agitated, that little agitation inside of me that propels me to do something, say something, be, that compounds on itself if I don't do something to stop it. And then I end up somewhere where I didn't really ever want to be with regards to speaking to a person or spending my time or what I, you know, whatever. So, so those are some of the things that I use regularly to try to keep myself on target and on track. And uh, in, in terms of, uh, if, so you, you have kids, I think, here, right? I don't. Oh, you don't. Okay. But let, let, let's say you had kids. What would you, what, how would you bring them up? Do you know, like? With all this stuff that you've learned, like what, how well, do you take them to the next, you know? Well, I, you know, one of the things that I've learned, because when you don't have kids, you watch other people with their kids um, a little bit more objectively because I have nothing vested in a parenting style I don't currently have. Um, but I really think it's important to to nurture to do the same thing with them, to nurture them to be in their own space, to encourage them to figure out who they are. I have a, one of the people in my family, uh, my chosen family, is, uh, is raising a daughter, and she's going to be six. I've known her since she was four. And the mother treats the daughter in a way that allows her to be really okay however she is, right? She's yeah. put off all of that socialization. We're going to get disconnected now. Uh, okay. So we just reconnect, but it takes, uh, from my side, it'll take like 30 seconds. Yeah. So just give it about 30 seconds and re reconnect. Okay. All right. All right. See you in a minute. All right. right so. Sorry about that. It's just uh, when you have a, a free account, this is. I know. I have a paid account and a free account. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah right, up, right after COVID started, we started doing because we had hosted events, and then COVID shut everything down right away. So we started doing a weekly uh, event, online event on Saturday nights. We started doing like panel discussions and stuff just to be able to keep people somewhat connected. So I just got a paid account right away. Yeah. All right. Well, when when during lockdown, I had a friend who had a paid account, and so we used to do a lot of uh, things together. And so I never needed a, a paid again. Oh, got it. Uh, yeah, and now, but we don't. So, um, okay, so that was that was good. And we've gone through, you know, your identity, the process, the, um, asking for help. Yeah, that that, that is that is really big. Like, what's the biggest thing you've asked for help for on on your side? You know, like I I I have asked for help. I go back and forth. And I mean, I told you I went to the school psychologist at 11 and said, you know, or 12, it was 12 by then, and said, I need help, right? So there's, there's big areas of my life where I've said I need help. And usually I, end up, I do end up asking for help when I'm sort of backed against a wall, right? Yeah. Um, my first marriage was, you know, we, it, it was just, I knew nothing about, uh, alcoholism or addiction or codependency and none about those things. And I was, I was deep in it. Like I, you know, I went from my first year of college, uh, I was miserable. I went back to the restaurant where I had worked in high school and I met somebody who was uh, just a couple years older than me, but like they drank the way I wanted to drink. And I didn't even think there was anything wrong with that as a criteria for a relationship. Right. Um, and so we were a couple, three years into it and it was just, miserable and so i got to a point where i like sort of caved in i was like sort of done i threw my hands up in the air i'm like i can't do this anymore this whole thing we're doing and uh 
that woke them up a little bit. And then we started to seek help. And I found a therapist at that time who was experienced with like drug and alcohol recovery and stuff like that. And I leaned heavily into that. And that started me on my road of recovery, as it were. I learned about, you know, one of the, one of the life hacks for me is understanding codependency slash boundaries, right? At that point in my life at 18, 19, 20, 21, I had no boundaries. I didn't even know what a boundary was. I had no idea where I ended and other people began. I had no idea, um, like all of the things I've learned in the years since then, right? Like what I think of you is none of your business. Like what you yeah. think of me is none of my business. Like, you know, where everyone is their own person. And ha so, ha so I started to learn about boundaries at this point in time, right? And eventually I was able to make my way out of this marriage. And then I got into another one. And then I got to the point where I recognized that I needed recovery around the, the alcohol side myself, right? When I was in the earlier time, my codependency was so great that I didn't have to necessarily look at my drug or alcohol issues. Because honestly, I, my grandmother died of codependency. I say this to people all the time. She literally gave her whole life to my grandfather, who was not a kind person. They, and she got to a point in her, I want to say in her early 60s, where she saw it. And she didn't have the strength to do anything about it. So she started this path of self-destruction, like psychosomatic the, like the will to die started for her. She just didn't want to do what she was doing, but she didn't have the strength to do anything else. So I didn't live with her at that time, but I would, you know, I get a call. Grandma was in the hospital. It was this. Grandma was in the hospital. It was that. Uh, grandma went to the doctor. At one point she had a doctor that she, she had uh, undefinable sort of gastrointestinal distress. It couldn't ever be diagnosed as anything. Right. Then at some point they thought it was psychosomatic. So they thought, oh, she's depressed and they wanted to put her on antidepressants, but that didn't help anything either. So then she goes to another doctor and, and I don't know this doctor, but I thank him and bless him every day that he told her that she had some thing in her stomach that Pepto-Bismol would treat. So he sent her home with Pepto-Bismol for when her stomach was upset, but he did it in a way that let her feel like she was being treated for whatever it was that was bothering way safer than putting you on antidepressants, way safer than putting you on any number of things. He gave her some benign way to address her gastrointestinal discomfort because he understood that there was nothing that could really be done for her medically. And so when I got the call that said that grandma passed, I was really relieved for her because it's going out was the path she chose, right? Because she couldn't see another way out of this life she had had fallen into where she made another person so more important than her. She made another person's well-being, another person's care, another person's everything, so much of her own priority that she didn't know who she was. And she didn't know how to take care of herself. And she, she lost any sense she might have had of an ability to put a boundary between her and him. And so she gave up, right? Wow. Yeah. And, and so when I'm in recovery circles and we talk about things like alcoholism, drug addiction, codependency, um, dying of codependency is real to me. It's, it's not an unimportant thing to address in your life. Right. So, so that's one of the earliest places I was given. A, someone reached, I was in a deep hole and someone threw a rope in that I was able to start to climb out from. And it was around codependency first. And, and later was I able to, you know, as, as I, cause I went through a period of time where I didn't drink at all. It had been disgusted by the whole thing. So I didn't at all, but I didn't think I had an issue. So at some point alcohol crept back in. And then a few years later, the reality about who I was around that settled in. And, uh, and then I started that journey. And, uh, and so you know, the things like the, the six criteria I gave you for speaking and stuff, all of that comes out of my, my overall journey of recovery. So a lot of what I do comes from, from the things I've learned there over time. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, anyway, I forget where this question started. But 
Yeah, and uh, just it's, it's, you mentioned what other, others think of you is none of your business. Mm-hmm. That is a big one. That's like mm-hmm. I have to tell myself that on a regular basis. You know, like what others think of me is none of my business. Stay out of their, you know, business. You know, like I have to literally like. Well, when you're an intuitive person or you're a person that comes, if you come from trauma, um, most of us that have had trauma are hypervigilant. Right. So if I'm in a room, there's a, there's a, there's a hypervigilance and then there's a self-centeredness of being an alcoholic. Like if I'm in a room and I see you and you have a certain kind of look on your face and it's not happy, I'm sure it's about me. And I'm sure I have to find out what it is. Right. And neither of those things are likely true. Yeah. Right. What I have done in recovery is, is as I have, learned about this if i can't shake if we're at an event and i see you and we're friends but you have a certain kind of look on your face and a i'm sure it's something i did and i'm rather than turn myself inside out to try to figure out what it was i did or said i come up to you and i simply say hey um are we good like and they'll look at me strangely and I'll be, well, like, you, you look a certain kind of way. And I was just wondering if there was anything up. And they look at me. They're like, no, I have a little bit of indigestion. Right? Like, that's yeah. how not about me it is. <laughs> right? Unless but, it causes you know, indigestion. <laughs> right? But there was their opportunity to tell me if they were going to. Because other yeah. than that, like, other than a shot at telling me what's going on, after that, if you don't want to tell me, it's none of my business. Yeah. And even if it is about me, it's none of my business. Right. And, and on the flip side of that, if I had a certain kind of feeling about you, there was a period in my life where I felt like I was under some sort of compulsion to have to come and tell you about it. And then when somebody let me know that, no, what you think of other people is none of their business. Like suddenly I don't have to come to you with everything that occurs to me about you or about my relationship with you or whatever. Very freeing. There's a lot of freeing hacks in my life. Yeah, I mean, I I struggled with that massively, and when I overcame it, a lot of my insecurities, I I I became really confident, and I became a confidence coach. And ah. That that was uh, the biggest thing. People come to me, and it's basically, and I, my job was literally to train them not to care what other people think of them. But and once you train people not to care. Once they don't care what other people think, you become so free. You become so confident. You know, you can do anything. You know, so I literally used to run like two hour workshops, and my job was to push you so far that you didn't care what other people thought of you. And as soon as that, the magic would happen, and they'd be like, become really confident. They'd be like, wow. I like that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So I wrote that down. Yeah. It just, it's, um, it, it, I think it, it's it's built in in some way into our um, it's hardwired into our brains to care what other people think because like everybody has it, you know. It's, mm-hmm. like, it's so it's so like part of us. It's like you know, for us, it's it's the same as that we need to eat or breathe. Well, I mean, as you said it, I thought I you know, did you did you see Space Odyssey two thousand one? Yes, I have seen right it. in the in the early the early sequence about the cavemen. I there's, think so. Yeah, right. I, there's an early sequence about the cavemen, and then they, you know, they just have the discovery of man. Like once once humans or early humans started depending on each other for survival, very clearly you can see how right away what other people think of you seems to be important, mm. right? Like because. Because keeping group cohesion was directly related to survival, right? So you have yeah. to, at a certain level, care about what other people think. Yeah, yeah. Because it's imperative to survival, and we're not in those boats anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, like, becoming more, I think, volitional about it, and less compulsive about it, right? Like, I can choose who I want to care about what they think. Right. I don't have to compulsively think it, I, that I have to care about what everybody thinks. Well, I, I people watch, and um, and and one of the things you can do is like when you're on the tube or the you, the underground, mm-hmm. and a beggar comes in. It's really interesting 
how everybody else behaves. Because mm -hmm. what you notice is how everybody treats that beggar is how the first couple of people treated him. If the first couple of people ignore the beggar, then you'll realize most people would just ignore him as well. But if the first couple of people pay attention to the beggar or they give them money, then you'll find that uh, the, the beggar will get more money towards, by the end of it because it, it's become the norm that, Jeez. you know, this is how the beggar is treated. Uh, so yeah, so I, I'm like, so as soon as every time, like, you know, we have beggars on the tube, every time a beggar oh, comes sure. in, I'm watching, I'm watching people, do you know that, but I'm seeing, ah, I'm watching the beggar, I'm watching the people to see who's going to react first, who's going to, you know, yeah. you know, and, and I've noticed like when, when, if the first person gives the beggar some money, that's it, that beggar's in, in the money, you know, like, wow, I don't think I've ever noticed that. Yeah. It's just, just watch. Uh, yeah, no, what I usually what I usually look for are shoes. Oh, right. Okay, shoes. That's well, it, it, you look at their shoes. Cuz there's people who are begging because they're genuinely like in a down and out, right? And then there's people who's begging because it's like an easy way to make a living. And they've done they've done stories about it, they've done exposés about it. There was a woman who used to beg on Fifth Avenue and she would have this whole get up and then so they started following her with a camera. And she would, when she was done with her day, she would walk. And then there was a van she had parked like somewhere a few blocks off. And she'd go in the van and change out of her costume. And they actually filmed her like as her normal self, like going out to the bar with her friends. And then she'd come every day in her um, disguise, essentially. And bag, like yeah. it's a way to make a living because people, you can make money at it. So when the people come onto the subway, the tube, the underground, um, I look at their shoes. Okay. All right. No, I've never paid attention to the shoes. I'm Pay attention to the shoes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll keep an eye out for that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because but... they, they may have made some attempt to make themselves look unkempt. Mm. But the difference between like broken down $20 shoes and, you know, gently used $200 sneakers is telling to me. It would be, wouldn't it? If, yeah. if you paid attention to it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to pay attention to how people treat the beggar from now on. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the same thing happens in London as well. We have a lot of Korea beggars. Um, and, I, and I used to live in Putney, which is like a really posh part of London. Mm. And there was a beggar at the uh, tube station. He was there for like 20 years. Like, he would always be there. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years ago, he got caught, exactly like uh, yours, uh, where the police followed him. And turned out he had a flat in Chelsea, right? And Putney's rich, but Chelsea's even richer. And this oh, really? Guy, yeah. And so this guy begged in Putney, which is basically the next borough for us, you know? Right. And uh, But he lived in Chelsea. He, he owned a flat in Chelsea. Owned a flat? Is, yeah, which is insane. So, like, Chelsea, like, you have to be, a, you know, literally a millionaire to live there. Uh, and that's where most of the millionaires live as well. But and and they, this got reported in the newspapers, and there were people, you know, were so pissed because people were like complaining that I've been giving money to that beggar for twenty years, and he's richer than me. <laughs> well, I mean, who who's there to be mad at? I mean, he he clearly figured it out, right? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, yes, yeah, but, yeah. And, and and you'll notice that with um, groups of people as well. You know, like especially if there's a group of lads or a group of women, when they get on the subway, they're really loud and you know, like pingy. You know, like that they they're very super confident. But if you watch them as one by one they get off, and then you're left with the last person. As soon as it's just the last person on their own. They suddenly become really conscious and they suddenly tighten up and they pull their phone out and look down and become extremely quiet. You know, like they shrink. Yeah. It's because they're in that tribe. They're in their little right, tribe. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, One of the things that we teach people to do is how to take up space. Yeah. As individuals, right? Like that closed in thing, like how to take up space and just be in the world, let yourself be in the world. Right. So some of that is the confidence that comes from the introspection. And then when you begin to allow yourself to be vulnerable enough with another person, and then you also see what it feels like to 
allow another person to become vulnerable with you, right? You realize that you have now the skills to create safe space for other people, right? There's a, there's a great confidence building involved with that, right? Like, cause you, you're someone who offers other people value just simply by listening, right? A lot of what we do is based around the idea of seeing and being seen, hearing and being heard. Like, the majority of people really just want to be seen and heard. Mm -hmm. The majority of us don't have a place where we can be. When you can be seen and heard free of judgment, life changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is actually um, very important. Not for other, not just for other people, but for yourself. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a health coach, and the, the biggest thing I, I, I'm trying to teach people is how to hold space for their own body to heal. Mm -hmm. You know, like once you hold space for your own body to heal, it heals, you know? Right. But people just don't know how to do that. And yeah, no, we have a, a relative right now who's been in the hospital, he had a heart attack. And he was, he was a mess. Like, there was concern that he wasn't coming back, like, like even mentally or anything. And so he's been in the hospital, he's been in ICU, he's been... And we're watching him and he's recovering. And I said to my partner, I'm like, they're not helping him. His body's healing itself. Yes. He's just, the hospital is like the safe space for him to make sure that he's like got enough fluids. He can, his body can be maintained while it heals itself. Right. And it's a yes. miracle to watch. It's a miracle to watch his brain rewire and his communication skills to come back. And like, what an incredible like machine human bodies are in terms of how we're programmed for yeah. health, right? Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So I hear what you're saying. It's almost like creating a safe container for our bodies. I like that. Write that down. And, and, and you mentioned space. That, like, I, I, I mean, I, I used to be in the pickup community. I don't know if you've heard of that. Mm -mm. Uh, 